It's the same hustle, it's the same pain. Same tears on every day. Maybe one day we will see we're one big family. Like it's one channel. It's the same sunshine, it's the same rain. The same struggle, just to maintain. Maybe one day we will see we're one big family. Like it's one channel. Yeah. Greetings, and welcome to An American Deception, revealing America's dark skin past. I'm your host, Tavis Sanders. I'd like to welcome our co-host, Renee Sanders. Greetings. So today we wanted to give you an overview of Indeed, a nonprofit organization established to educate the public of the omitted history of the dark skin indigenous peoples of the southeastern United States. As a part of Indeed's mission, we've created An American Deception. And American Deception was built to educate the, the public. And so let's talk about some of the services that we offer through Indeed. Okay, one of the things that we offer are educational presentations. These educational presentations are, uh, again, to inform the public about the dark-skinned indigenous people of southeastern United States. First one is called the Mound Builders. And the Mound Builders is, is explaining about the people that were here before the Europeans arrived, the different types of mounds that they built, which were uh, conical mounds, uh, platform mounds, and the effigy mounds, mm -hmm. which were the mounds that were in the shapes of animals or some kind of a religious symbol or figure. I know they also called them dirt pyramids. Some of the mounds were called dirt pyramids because some of them have flat sides. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are flat sided, they do call them pyramids. They're four sided and there's also some five sided ones. Uh, but most of them really they look like mountains or hills okay and those were mounds and as a matter of fact when Europeans arrived here they really didn't realize that they were built by the indigenous people here mm -hmm. so many of them were destroyed mm -hmm. and this is one of the things that we discuss in the mound builders okay I know that you said we have a few educational presentations I know one of them is uh, called the Native American slave trade who were the real slaves can you give us a little bit of information about that Yes, the, uh, the Native American slave trade is something that they really leave out of the history books where they don't discuss how the indigenous people here in the United States were used as slaves. As a matter of fact, they were the first slaves here in the United States. And the African slave trade was really built on top of the Native American slave trade. So um, this is one of the things that we discuss in, in that who were the real slaves because once you really delve into that, you would really find out that many of those dark-skinned people that were enslaved, many of them were the indigenous native people of the United States. All right. And I know we have one more educational presentation entitled Brown, Black, and White, Race and Native Americans. Could you just give me a brief overview? Yes, that one is really talking about the race laws that were here in the United States and it is showing how laws were used against the indigenous people to turn them into something that they were not. So it turned the indigenous people into Negroes. Negroes became equivalent to slave. Slave became equivalent to African, which now made all the indigenous people now Africans. And many of them now are calling themselves African Americans, but they're really indigenous to right. the United States. And you start, you're talking about the black population also. That's another term that we use to identify ourselves. Yes, that's correct, yes. So we offer educational presentations, and those are the titles of the three. We offer them in the various ways. We have uh, the presentations that we actually do inside of schools, libraries, and museums. And we also have a documentary series that we offer the programs through. Okay, along with the, uh, the presentations and the DVDs that we do offer about the present, the, those presentations, we also uh, have what we call community beautification that we do here in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, we feel that it is important to give back to the communities. Um, and it is important for us to show that example to the neighborhoods also so that hopefully they will join us in beautifying and keeping our neighborhoods uh, clean and keeping them um, proud of where they live. 
Yeah, um, and just to touch on that subject, I know when we do go out and do the cleanups, we have a lot of elders and actually a lot of the young children. They come and they come and participate when we're doing them on their blocks or in a park near their home. And it really does seem to put a sense of pride in something that they've done to accomplish in their neighborhood. Yes, and we don't even have to ask them to come out. We don't even solicit. We just go there and we start cleaning up and the people see that and they come out and join us. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. So I know we have a short version of our educational uh, documentary, The Mound Builders. i like for them to take a look at that and uh, we'll be right back. Greetings, I'm your host Red Tell. Welcome to an introduction to the Mound Builders, the first in a four-part series entitled An American Deception. We'll see you in a few minutes. Brown-skinned people, from very light to the darkest of dark, have existed in the Americas continuously for many thousands of years. Writer Jack Forbes, in his book, Africans and Native Americans said many but not all Native Americans were brown or dark colored without African ancestry. These brown skinned people lived here long before the dawn of European civilization and the arrival of the European settlers. When the Europeans arrived to the shores of the United States they encountered a culture of people that became known as the Mound Builders. Mound Builder is a general term referring to the indigenous inhabitants of North America who built various styles of earthen mounds for burial, residential, and ceremonial purposes. Here you see a sampling of mound sites that have been discovered in the United States. These mounds are primarily visible from the Mississippi River to the Appalachian Mountains, from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. Most are located along rivers and streams which the Native Americans used for provisions. The most modern Native American cultures have been divided into three eras. The Archaic Era, from 8000 BCE, or before the Christian Era, to 1000 BCE. The Woodland Era, from 1000 BCE to 1000 CE, or the Christian Era. And the Mississippian Era, from the years 1000 to 1700, and there is evidence of mound builders in all three eras. The mound builders have been attributed to building four basic types of mounds. The most common mounds are the conical mounds. Conical mounds are mounds that are cone or oval shaped. Many of these types of mounds were for burial purposes. Burial mounds ranged in height from 3 feet to 25 feet and the remains were probably of someone of importance in the society. Conical mounds that weren't burial mounds can have heights up to 70 feet. The second type of mound is the earthen mound or earthen lodge. This type of mound usually had a fire pit in the center and was used for important meetings amongst the chiefs. The Europeans, after their arrival, utilized these mounds by turning them into their military forts, amongst other things. The third type of mounds are effigy mounds. Effigy mounds are mounds that are in the shape of animals, symbols, religious, or human figures. These mounds may have served as territorial markers or enhanced sacred ceremonial ground where people met for major events. Modern Native American shaman or spiritual healers suggest that the effigy mounds enhanced the power for the healing and communication with the ancestor spirits. The last type of mound is the platform mound. Platform mounds or temple mounds are flat topped mounds which were used to house temples for the leaders, for ceremonial purposes, sometimes for residences, and sometimes for survival needs such as observing up and down the waterways for unwanted visitors. Welcome back. Even here in Philadelphia, there are remnants of these great and ancient structures. I stand now at the steps of Philadelphia's famous landmark, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. 
But did you also know that this historic location, which the museum now occupies, was once called Fairmont by the colonial settlers? Up until the time of colonial settlement, this land belonged to the indigenous Americans. And if the mound would have remained undisturbed, it would have been classified as a platform mound today. In 1812, an engine house was built at the bottom of Fairmont to pump water from the Schuylkill River to the top. This lady became known as the Fairmont Waterworks. In 1919, the mound began its most recent transformation into what is now known as the Philadelphia Museum of Art. You have just finished watching the first in the four-part series entitled An American Deception. For more information, please email us at anamericandeception at gmail.com. We'll be right back with an American Deception on Philly Cam. Welcome back to An American Deception, Revealing America's Dark Skin Past. In the first segment, we went over the history of Indeed and some of the services that we offer to the community. But I'd like to ask you now, you know, what about history and why do you think that is important? I think it's important because it has been left out of the history books. The history of the dark-skinned indigenous people here in the United States has not really totally been revealed any place where history is told, they seem to eliminate the dark-skinned indigenous people here. So it is important for the people here in the United States, everyone, for them to know this history so that some of these dark-skinned people who are labeling themselves maybe as African-American may find out that they are not actually African-American, but that they are Indian, really, or indigenous to this land, Native Americans, or however you want to, uh, whatever terminology that you are comfortable with. Yeah, you know, I kind of look at it like, if you leave a large block of history out of uh, the books that people are educated on, turn those people into something else, something that fits the, the status that the people that are writing these books want to fit these people as. You know, you can identify them as being this because you remove the history of who they really are. Exactly, and when people begin to realize that that term Negro, which was defining the dark-skinned people here in the United States, was also including a, a population of people who were here already. So uh, the native people, the indigenous people of the United States, many of them were dark-skinned people. Dark-skinned, some of them had woolly hair, it, uh, it is not the uh, depiction that we see now of what they want us to think that how the Native Americans looked. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and these people have been left out of history. And you know, I actually, I like to bring it up to speed today too, because you know, when, when you learn where you're from, you start to care more about that environment. And as uh, black people, you know, especially in the inner cities, you know, we see a, 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 a very, very big description, um, discrepancy between the neighborhood that they live in and who they really want to be. You know, everybody wants to go back to where they think that they came from, and so they don't care about what's happening here as much. Yes, exactly. And when people can be when when people can connect those dots to a history, to a real history, 
that uh, that doesn't stop at 1860. Mm-hmm. You know, you have a history that connects people to this landmass for thousands of years. Yes, exactly. You know, they will begin to take more pride in this land because now they know where their roots are, that their roots haven't been taken away from them, that they were they were stolen from them, but now they can reclaim them again. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why we think this is important for this information to come out. Right. And, you know, we just like to identify uh, also that, you know, a lot of the information that you'll be getting from, from us you also be able to find them. You know, we want to make sure that we're not just giving you information, but we're giving you factual information. You know, I know that uh, Napoleon stated that history was a myth that men tend to agree upon. And I really don't like that. I don't like that history is a myth that is created by the writer. Yes, history, uh, one of the definitions of history is that it, it defines who you are and why you are the way you are. Mm-hmm. So if you don't know your history, you cannot truly know who you really are. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's, I, I totally agree with you. But you know, let's talk about that point for a moment because uh, I know in a lot of magazines, I know uh, on some television programs, even uh, some of the uh, programs that trace people's heritage, will, you know, the individual initially say, I heard that I have Native American in my blood. Uh, and then when they go through the program or the DNA test or uh, the individual does a, a ancestry uh, a trait on that individual, they will move them away from that. Well, again, I think you, you have to be very, very careful when you're um, going with those things. And um, again, because the people who are doing them don't, may not really know the actual history. And they are going by maybe colonial laws that said that, uh, that if you have one drop of African blood, then you are now a Negro. But the problem is, is that some of those people who are being defined as African were not African at all. Uh, they were defined that because of the laws that made slave and African equivalent. So what happened was these laws, again, turned these people into something that they were not. And now that you've changed the individual to something, or you've relabeled them or reclassified them or re-identified who they are, and now, you, now it gets back to today. You know, where uh, in a group of people can't really relate to what they're being taught. And so, since I can't relate to the individual or to the culture that is being taught to me about who I am or where I'm from, if the culture exists at all, and so they move away from their community, they move away from family and uh, respect to the elders, and they become distracted with whatever it is that they can get themselves involved with that and make themselves feel better about what they're doing because we've lost who we are. Yes, and that was one thing that, um, that especially in the early 1900s and um, in the 20th century, that black people were trying to identify with something. Mm-hmm. And we know that uh, black people have been told that you know, you know you have Native American in your blood. You know you have that Indian in your blood. And we have heard this, and many black families have heard that. And we've heard that because our ancestors did not want us to forget that. Uh-huh. And they couldn't write it down because it was against the law for them to write it down. So they had to pass this history down orally. Right. And we had that oral history. However, because the history books wanted to turn us into something else, then, then we can no longer identify with that. And, um, and this is what history has done, has turned us into something that our ancestors told us that we were not. 
but now we are believing because in the past 50 years, we've been told we're African American, so now we tend to believe that's what we are. And, and in actuality, we may be something else. Yes. You know, and a large portion of us, even if we choose to identify ourselves as African American, you should still know the, the, the whole history of who you are, the full history and a factual history about where, who you are, where you came from, and how to relate the two cultures into one. Yes, and again, because if you were told that you have native in your blood, that native is still there. All right. Well, we'd like to wrap it up for right now. We'll be back with more of An American Deception. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back with more of An American Deception on Philly Cam. Today, a more accurate depiction of the Native Americans of the United States is beginning to unfold because history has been told to us by Europeans with a European point of view. We have, up until recently, been given our historical facts in a distorted manner. Author Carol Birkin in her book First Generations explains that historians have come to understand that they must handle journals, government reports, sermons, books, and diaries written by Europeans about Native Americans cautiously as artifacts of European adjustment to cultural diversity rather than true guides to Indian societies. This European adjustment has given us a distorted view and has allowed many misconceptions and inaccuracies to be perpetrated. Case in point, most people believe that the existence of dark-skinned people in the United States began with the African slave trade. The truth is, as writer Jack Forbes expresses in his book, Africans and Native Americans, many but not all Native Americans were of a dark complexion without African ancestry. Truth be told, it was the Native American slave trade that placed many dark-skinned people into slavery. And to keep these facts in obscurity, many books evade the subject of the Native American slave trade. William L. Katz in his book, Black Indians, says it eloquently when he states that omission, not distortion, is the far more serious culprit in hiding the story of the Black Indians of the Americas. At the time of European contact, there were dozens of chiefdoms scattered across the South, one so large that it spanned from present-day eastern Tennessee to northern Georgia and eastern Alabama. After Hernando de Soda and other explorers encountered these chiefdoms, many became unstable via diseases, warfare, and slavery. Although many attribute the demise of many Native people to diseases that they did not have natural immunities to, one must examine forces other than disease, in particular, the commercial trade in Indian slaves to the termination of many Southern clans, tribes, and chiefdoms. As the European arrived to the shores of America, they began utilizing the native people to help build their colonies. The Native Americans welcomed their new neighbors, and using the words of writer Alan Gallet, Indians secured the colonies against external and internal foes while providing the economic wherewithal for each colony's survival. He goes on to say, they, the Native Americans, chose not to conquer the Europeans. He says warfare was conducted for specific cultural and geopolitical purposes, and the removal of the European colonies did not meet those ends the Europeans were not as cordial to their new neighbors. The Europeans, beginning with Christopher Columbus, began enticing and tricking the native population into servitude. 
And as I have previously stated, Christopher Columbus initiated the transatlantic slave trade by transporting thousands of Native Americans to Spain to become slaves in the Mediterranean slave trade. Slavery was considered a part of any expedition of discovery and conquest. So as stated in Indian slavery during colonial times, not to follow such a custom would have been acting contrary to the spirit of the times. During exploring expeditions in America, leaders like Hernando de Soto and Paz de Leon needed a means to reward the services of their soldiers. Since other means of payment were scarce, slavery satisfied this need. And again, using the words of writer Almon Wheeler Lauber from his book, Indian Slavery During Colonial Times, many of the exploring expeditions were slave raids or kidnapping excursions. The captured women were distributed amongst the soldiers and used in whatever manner the soldiers saw fit, which means many of those women were raped. The captured men assisted in whatever menial task needed to be done, such as mining, fishing, paddling, hunting, cutting wood, and of course, building houses. Slave raids became common in the South, and most slaves were basically kidnapped from their tribes. However, as more Europeans arrived, kidnapping was no longer a viable system of obtaining the number of slaves that was needed to help build and maintain the new colonies. Warfare and trade became a more productive way to obtain slaves. Warfare was a way the Native Americans acquired captives before the arrival of the Europeans. These captives, which the Europeans confused with slaves, were used for specific purposes. They became a medium of exchange between tribes to purchase peace with a stronger tribe, make reparations for losses of war within a tribe, barter for war captives, amongst other things. Even though the Europeans used warfare as a means of obtaining slaves since their arrival in the Americas, by the late 16th century, early 17th century, it became practically the sole means of acquiring Native American slaves. The Native Americans then began to be enticed with European-made goods in exchange for any slaves they turned over to the Europeans. Native goods, such as hatchets, scissors, hoes, knives, etc., which were made from bone, stone, or wood, were inferior to the same tools manufactured by the European because theirs were made out of metal. These metal tools made work quicker and easier, so they became in big demand amongst the native people. Clothing, such as white linen shirts, petticoats, jackets, and woolen blankets were also popular items to trade with the native population. The most valuable European goods were guns and ammunition. Somebody fam got a Benz on tens. 
Somebody push a bucket with a car full of friends. Somebody found locked up, trying to get cleaned up, trying to flip green up, couldn't give the street up, y'all. Somebody found, pray for better days. 